Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, a recount is underway to determine the winner in Arizona's 2nd Congressional District, and Diane Douglas is the state's next superintendent of public instruction. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Mike Sonix of the Phoenix Business Journal. Well, it looks like a recount in Arizona's 2nd Congressional District race between incumbent Ron Barber and the apparent winner, Martha McSally. Is the recount now a done deal? Have we gotten that? What's going on? Yeah, it's, it's a done deal at this point. So what happened after the ups and downs of uh, the, uh, the uh, ch ch changes in the leads over the last several days. Uh, Martha McSally had, had been holding on to a very small, very slim lead, and finally the count is done um, for now, and she's leading by 161 votes. And uh, if the vote is less, if the, 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 uh, the lead is less than 200 votes, there's going to be a recount. So that's very, that's certain at this point there will be a recount. And what's always interesting is people think recount, they, 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 they have this image of Florida and the hanging chads. <laughs> In Arizona, the recount is done by the same machines that did it before. There's a small hand sample. So uh, I always find it fascinating when you put the same ballots to the same machines, you come up with different numbers, which always has made me wonder a little bit about the whole technological and, and, system. And we're not going to find any ballots laying around anymore, right? That, that, that's all done that with there? That is theoretically done. There was a problem with the Continental School District and some change in, in that kept them aside, and all of a sudden, hey, it's like Chicago. But uh, no, we, we think all the ballots are found. Now, now the question becomes which provisionals get counted, which don't. And that could lead to some litigation in terms of, uh, of, of are these proper, are these improper, because it, depending on where they're from, mm -hmm. they could help certainly Ron Barber. Uh, surprised that this has gone this direction? Well, it was close last time. This was a Republican year overall, nationally, statewide, and, and so, um, you know, McSally kind of folks thought she had the maybe the best odds of the three, you know, bellwether uh, races, battleground races that Democrats won the other two. And so, yeah, I could see litigation on this if it gets really, really tight. Um, and you had, you had the Cochise County uh, machines break down, so they had to truck them to, to Graham County. So that put them a couple of, a day behind schedule. When you have to go to Graham County for something, uh, you, you, you know there's going to be some issues. So. Well, the other part of the issue, of course, and we've talked about it around this table, is with the three competitive districts, supposedly, they sort of, Republicans figured Kirsten Sinema is not going anywhere, so let's not waste money there. Then I think they started seeing the writing on the wall in terms of Ann Kirkpatrick that, you know, do we really want to burn our money there? That left Ron Barber. And while Ron certainly got in two years ago because of the Gabriel Giffords sympathy factor, if, if you will, I don't know that he's shown a lot on his own that he's can do much, and given how close McSally came even two years ago, I think that became their best effort. D is there a political future for Ron Barber? Well, obviously there is. I mean, it's a very, it, it was a very close election. If it turns out that he is going to lose by less than 200 votes you know, at the end of the recount, and yeah, um, I mean, they've, he's won one, she's won one, assuming she wins, she wins, she's, she won now, and assuming the recounts, recount confirms that, it's basically 1-1 one, one, or rather 2-1 or, uh, two, two, or something like that. But anyway, the point is that, yes, of course there's future for him. The question for the Democratic Party is, do you want him again running for that seat? Do you want something else new? you want fresh blood, new, you know, someone, uh, a, a new phase in the Democratic yeah. Party? Well, you want someone like that? The challenge is, is it's not easy to find good candidates. You know, Kirsten Sinema could be beat in that district. They just haven't come up with very good candidates. She's run good campaigns. She's, she's moved to the middle. She's raised a lot of money. But that district is, is, a, is, a, is a battleground district, and they haven't been able to get kind of an a, a first stringer on there. And you could say anything about Andy Tobin up there. Uh, you know, they really pummeled him in that race. And if you look at the Barber uh, McSally, who, who do you replace Ron Barber with? It's kind of like a football coach thing. Are you going to actually bring in somebody that's, well, that's better? And that's been the problem with the Democratic Party that we're seeing at the statewide level. The Democrats have never really developed a farm system. Now, mm -hmm. part of it is being in the minority mm -hmm. at the legislature and not having people who can move up into that. But let's look around. Okay, so who the Democrats offer four years from now from governor or secretary of state? I'm sorry, Terry, it's done. Put a fork in it. You know, it, it isn't going to happen. So what does that leave? You know, look at the, the leadership in the House and Senate, 
And, you know, there are some possibilities there, but not a lot. And the Democrats really need to do a better job of developing and there's been a lack of, I think there's a lack of diversity with Democrats. You have a lot of white guys running for first seats. And I think it maybe would help the Democrats to turn out younger voters and Hispanics if you have Latinos running, if you have minorities running once in a while. But they, like well, Howie said, they, well, tend, to, they, they tend to have a lot. It tends <laughs> to be like two white guys running each other. Well, well except we, we had David Garcia. Exactly. Uh, basically but, the surprise yeah. of the entire election. But was that was a down ticket that? one. You, know, you had Goddard and Duval. Uh, up there, and it seems to be some of the same names, the same names too often. And like Howie said, you don't have these kind of fresh faces out there that people will take a look at. And it's not too late for the Democratic Party to start looking for new faces, if you will. I think they may be grooming uh, Randall Fries, a new uh, this new legislator, incoming legislator from Tucson. Obviously, somebody who's uh, was uh, a doctor during the shooting of uh, Gabby Giffords, so popular in that district. Um, uh, you know, won his race to the uh, uh, Arizona House. So I wonder if looking, if they're looking at him, um, you know, he could be someone that they can groom uh, probably to run for something bigger, maybe a statewide office, maybe even a congressional seat well, or something. And we'll have something. to see the kind of bills he introduced. Look, Democrat bills generally not going anywhere, but when you introduce things and you put your name behind them and you show you can work with folks, you may be right. What about Steve Farley down there? What's oh, this is, <laughs> you know, Steve Farley somehow thought he was also going to be Senate president, I think, at, at one point, and uh, uh, he was a legend in his own mind, perhaps, there. Uh, he's a quote-unquote fresh young face, but he sometimes doesn't even get along with members of his own caucus, ah, so that okay. creates some interesting problems there. All right. Um, we did mention uh, that Garcia did concede uh, his race, superintendent of public instruction to Diane Douglas. We had Diane Douglas mm -hmm. on the program, and uh, she thinks, I tried it, I'm <laughs> curious about this being a mandate. I mean, you're talking 40 some odd percent of the vote, 0.55 margin of difference. She thinks it's a mandate. Well, let's even parse this a little further. You had a 45% turnout. She had 50% of 45%, and that 45% is really only half of the people who are eligible to vote. So we're, we're somewhere down in, in the 20% range here. Is it a mandate? Well, she did make it her sole issue. Uh, Garcia waged a, quite frankly, lousy campaign. How so? Well, here is Diane Douglas saying to everybody, we don't want pointy-headed academicians. We don't want business people determining what's good for your kids. She said on the show here, she said, uh, and during the debate, you know, the business people just want to make worker bees out of people. So how does David Garcia come back? Talks about the pointy ac academicians and the business people who backed him. Um, the other part of it, I'll put some large blame on the business community. The chamber endorsed him. Where was the money to go with that? Where was the early independent expenditure? to bring people out, to have the heads of major corporations saying, if you want quality jobs in Arizona, this is how you'll and vote. Maybe it wouldn't have made a difference, and maybe not. The thing is, there was money that was going towards David Garcia's campaign. I mean, remember, about $800,000 in independent spending mm -hmm. went to you know, try and help him win this race. And, and obviously, it was. On, on, on the other hand, Dan Douglas did not receive and basically less than $2,000 in, in independent spending and, and, went to... And that's why she is saying that this was the clearest way for citizens to reject Common Core, which was the alpha and omega of her campaign. I, I think some people voted for her because of Common Core, folks on the right. I think a lot of people voted for her because she was a Republican on the ticket and didn't really pay attention to the race. How he mentioned the business community, it's hard for the business community to cross party lines and to really back a Democrat because they have a lot of Republican friends at the legislature, a lot of Republican friends in the congressional delegation, and when they want to go down there and get tax but, breaks but or special would, treatment, but, it's very hard for them to, to really put their money where their mouth is on, on things like that. Let's talk about what's next. Kelly Ward is going to head the Education Committee in the Senate. Kelly has made abolition of Common Core her issue. Now. Can she get it out of the Education Committee? I'll bet you she can. But now we go back to the business community having to do what they perhaps should have done now, coming down there and saying, if you abolish Common Core, you're going to destroy the job creation here. You're going to destroy the Arizona recovery to the extent that it exists. We had a guy come down the last time this came up with Al Melvin and actually testified in front of the committee saying, I will not hire Arizona graduates because I'm not convinced they have the skills. And that's where the business community needs to come in. See, the, the way I'm looking at this right now is we have top policy makers in the education arena that are anti-common core. We have Doug Ducey, who's, 
opposed to Common Core, wouldn't say whether he would yeah. eliminate Common um, Core on, on his first day in office. We have Diane Douglas, of course, stridently opposed to Common Core. We have Kelly Ward, who's introduced at least three bills. One of them would have uh, required the school districts to develop their own standards. And so now we have a, a, a clearly anti-Common Core atmosphere in our top education policy offices. And I wonder if the, if the business community looks at that reality and says, well, we're not really sure what we can do no, or I, how we can I, fight. I think they fight it. I'd be willing, I'll make my first 2015 prediction here tonight that a common core abolition bill does not even get to the governor's desk. I think the business community makes this an issue and maybe son of 1062. Well, I, and I'll tell you one thing, uh, if the business community continues to repeat, we need educated workers, we need better education, it's gonna fall on deaf ears if they allow common core to go. Well, we should, we should qualify that, though, and, and Diane Douglas qualifies that. She says, Common Core bad, let's replace it with X, Y, Z. She has ideas for replacing those standards and a corresponding test. It's not like she wants everything to go away and, and no standards at all. Yeah, you could see a, uh, you could see a middle ground. I, I'm with Howie. I think it doesn't get through the Senate. I think there's enough moderate, so-called moderates in there to team with Democrats. But it could be the first real test for Ducey in terms of who do you side with? Do you side with this business wing of the party? Or are you with the social conservatives? Because he, he walked that tightrope pretty well in this race. He didn't answer a lot of things. This will put him on the spot a little but bit. But back to Howie's point there, I think his folks are going to try to make sure he's not put on the spot and it never gets to his desk. Well, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good governing. That's a good governor. There was a, there was a <laughs> failing in this session that 1062 made it that far. Um, and she had to veto it. If you're going to veto something as governor, well, you need to kind of make sure it doesn't get there. So, you, yeah, I think there'll be a major push not to see this, this crazy kind of common core uh, bill go to him. What, what clearly will happen is that Diane Douglas will use her bully pulpit. You know, by herself, she cannot do anything about Common Core. I mean, she's one of 11 votes on the State Board of Education. She can't do anything about it by herself. But she keeps uh, hammering that point and p keeps pressuring uh, uh, the state legislature with the help of Kelly Ward, for example, and those who are opposed to Common Core. I mean, it's conceivable to see s that we would see something get out of the legislature and on Ducey's desk now. It would be up to him yeah. what he does with it. But the problem becomes, what do you replace it with? If it's just simply, I mean, one of the bills last year was simply, as you say, to just let each school district make its own standards. Well, what was the whole purpose of having statewide standards? You know, they made a, a real clear point, this new AZ Merits. I, love, I think they come up with the acronym first and then fill in the <laughs> names later. The, the, the latest version of the Common Core uh, testing will be Arizona specific yet nationally normed. Uh, I have a feeling that there's going to be a little learning curve for, for Ms. Douglas when she gets up there. Uh, I think that in her own way, I think she'd like to hear what they have to say. I think she needs to be educated about it. Now, she may not change her mind, but at least they'll have an understanding of each other. All right, let's uh, final thoughts here, by the way. This is the first chance we've had our panel last week talking about the election, new panel this week. Final thoughts, Mike, on the election surprises and, and, and what happens, especially when it concerns the budget, which is hanging over everything. Well, they're in a corner a bit because it's so Republican dominated and they're, they're not going to raise taxes unless it goes to the voters. You have a governor who opposed uh, extending the sales tax. You have a lot of conservatives who, who sign or abide by anti-tax pledges. And that really puts them in a corner fiscally and, and financially. I think Douglas, the Douglas race kind of showed the Republican wave overall. I mean, that was, that was the closest one. That was the one that people pointed to as, as the Democrats possibly wanted. I think Michelle Reagan winning by her margin kind of showed the Republican strength. I think the congressional races shows the impact of the Independent Redistricting Commission. I think maybe Sinema and Kirkpatrick maybe want to send those, those, those three so-called Democrats uh, <laughs> a, a, Chris, a holiday card uh, to thank them on that because that, that helped, certainly helped, especially Kirkpatrick, I think, kind of hold on to that seat. Well, uh, a couple of thoughts. Let's start with the budget. We've got a half a billion dollars for this fiscal year, which is the equivalent of cutting a billion over the whole year. Now, if you're not going to raise taxes, if, as Doug Ducey said in his election night speech, we're not going to borrow, well, how many gimmicks can you do? I mean, you've got a $9.3 billion budget. You can't touch K-12, and that doesn't even count whether we're going to have to pay some more. Mm -hmm. You can't touch Medicaid. Nobody's going to touch corrections. I don't know how much more we could cut the universities with, without, uh, you know, just putting them out of business. So where do you do it? You can only do so many gimmicks. The other issue in terms of a final thought is if you didn't like the election results and you didn't vote, don't whine to me. 
Yeah, no, that and a lot of folks did not vote. Yes. Uh, I didn't see a heck of a lot. What, what happened to rock the vote and all those get out? Well, the vote it was things? all the stuff. I mean, the Latino community had a big press conference on how yeah, you know, we've got folks to register, and this time we're going to come out. Whatever it was, whether it was an anti-Obama feeling because he hadn't promised, you know, the the the, the, that, yeah. the, the action that maybe he is or is not taking next week. Uh, whether it was just nobody felt connected or, or whatever, but you know we get we go through this 45% turnout of of the people who actually bothered to register. That's sad. Um, as far as a uh, uh, governor like Ducey, I thought his speech on election night with the governor at his side was interesting. The phrase that you know if you if you think things are bad, help is on the way. Mm -hmm. We're coming. Help is on the. The governor's standing right next to him. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting <laughs> thing about this election is that Governor Ducey is not running on Governor Brewer's accomplishments, as, uh, or rather the Republican Party's accomplishments. I mean, he's selling himself, saying, you know, I'm a businessman, I can do a better job than the Democratic nominee. I mean, very clearly, he is not saying that vote for me because, you know, the party has done a very good job of managing the state. Now, of course, Governor Brewer faced some very tough of challenges during our time, but the fact still remains that we're facing a $1.5 billion deficit. And whatever you say, they were in charge when this deficit is, is, uh, is occurring or had occurred or resulted. Uh, we're not sure if they're a direct result of the policy decisions that they made, but they were in charge. And so now m my thoughts is that w what we basically have is status quo. We have five Republicans. Uh, and holding statewide offices, and we're going to have the same thing. The partisan ratio in the Senate and in the House remains the same. It is status quo. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Scott Smith was the the Brewer candidate. I mean, he was the one that, that like Common Core, that like Medicaid, you know, worked with Chuck Coughlin. Was was the was the Brewer candidate, and you know, Ducey was a little bit to the right. But does that make the, that makes the solutions even harder because he's to the right, and then you have legislatures who would love to go way far to the right, and the, and they, some of them will try to do that. And that's going to be the big challenge because Andy Biggs, as the veteran of all this, is going to try to use his force and personality to, you know, over Dave Gowan, who's kind of untested as House Speaker, Doug Ducey, who's also kind of untested as, as governor, you know, treasurer, he didn't get in the middle of the politics. And uh, it's going to be real interesting to see how they manage to, to, to pull this out. I mean, you've got bigs who would love to cut, you know, a half billion this year and another billion next year. Okay, and that's going to occur where? Yeah, I mean, as far as the honeymoon period, is this uh, uh, how, how many hours? Oh, no, I, th I think it'll last for a while till all of a sudden, I, we saw the same thing with Jan Brewer, we see with every governor. You know, they, they make nice, and then when they send them the first bill that, I, I told you not to send me that, and the first veto, and then, you know, the, the, you know or, or for example, one of the perennial bills is legislature always sends up a bill giving it control of federal monies. I've watched lawmakers who become governors who voted for that bill as lawmakers who, when they become governors, say, Excuse me, mm -hmm. I am the governor. And, and to that point, will a Doug Ducey, a, a Martha McSally for that matter, uh, two Republicans who ran to the right and then have slowly creeped out back to the center once in office, where do they land? I think there's some realism that'll, that'll pop in for, for Ducey, especially on the budget, how far he can go. I, I don't know. We didn't find that out in the campaign because he really wasn't pushed enough to, to answer some of those questions. Oh, no, questions. he was pushed. Yeah. He just didn't answer. He does, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and, and ask did our that. host there about yeah. how he pushed about that. But yeah, he, so we don't really Really know, and and you know what happens if 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 son of 1062 or son of 1070 come to his desk, or a really right wing Common Core thing, where does he go? We, we're not really sure where he's going to go on that. Is he Scott Walker? You know, uh, I could see parallels between he that. He wants to be Scott and Walker, and he could be a very, and a very divisive governor <laughs> in some levels. But will he take on? I don't think he'll take on directly the legislature like Brewer did on some issues. So, I think it'll be more subdued. So when Brewer uh, came onto the scene in 2009. Her, very, her closest advisors basically came to her and said, this is how big the problem is. And really, these are our only options. The governor looked at the problem and decided that we have to do a tax increase. And that kind of realism pervaded her administ administration. And we saw that time and time again when she would look at an issue and said, well, I can't govern as a Republican or uh, a conservative or whatever, I have to govern as a governor in charge of the state and I have to make things run. We've seen that time and again during our administration. I wonder if we see that uh, happen during the very first weeks of Ducey's administration when you have his advisors basically so. saying, look, this is the reality, 
you have to deal with it. Now let's make some tough and, decisions. And that becomes an, an interesting question. I don't think he has any idea of the storm that's going to hit him. I mean, he knows there's a half a billion and a billion. I don't know, even if he's been treasurer for four years, because he said, well, now I'm going to study the budget, but that he has any idea of where he can cut, where he can't. You know, can we extend out maybe the, the tax cuts for corporations that are supposed to take cut in 16, 17, 18, maybe push them back. You know, that gets, gets us maybe 100 or 200 million right there. Are there other options that we can do? And maybe even at some point, a la Jan Brewer, saying to voters, look, you know, if you want to keep these things whole, maybe we need a temporary yeah, fix. Brewer, Brewer was poised to lose that 2010 primary before 1070 came along, and, and kind of saved her. She was she was really threatened in that thing because she because she uh, governed and, and and supported the tax increase. And, and it'd be so hard for Ducey because he opposed it. It, was, it wasn't like he was just sat on the sidelines. He was the reason that the extension didn't go through. He was he led that campaign. So that really paints him into the corner. We have to remember also that. You know, voters have approved time and time again tax cuts. If it's specific, if they know where it's going. Tax increases. Uh, ta I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, tax increases. If, they're, if it's specific and they know where it's going. We saw that with, uh, you know, uh, the 110 sales tax. We saw that with, uh, with early childhood uh, development, development. We saw that recently in this news, I mean, in this election cycle with the, with the, uh, uh, the hospital bond, bond in Maricopa County. So voters, when they see that there's a sense to a tax increase, proposal, they would vote for it. And, 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 and it would be up to Ducey to look at that and say, uh, yeah, but now we got to find out, is he a pragmatist or is he ideologue? If he's a pragmatist, he can go that route. There are people, and we saw this even during the Simon administration, hey, the economy's down. This is our chance to shrink government. Government is the enemy. We need a $5 billion budget for the state. And there are people who were elected, some newbies and some veterans, who would be just as happy with a $5 billion budget. I think he, he's been a candidate for so long. He was a candidate when he was treasurer. <laughs> he wanted to run for governor last time, but he had to wait. Um, so he ran for treasurer. He's been running as a candidate all this time. And it's going to be hard for someone as a candidate in, a Republican, in the Republican Party to support a tax increase. It's going to be a tough, a tough uh, pill to swallow. Okay, before we get out of here, I want to know who uh, Cece Velasquez is and why is she running from the law? <laughs> uh, she... Uh, she is on the run. You're right about that. We, not a whole lot that we know about uh, uh, Representative Elect Velasquez. She had worked for Martin Gazada's law office since 2009 uh, and also worked for his, uh, for his campaign. But uh, you are right. She is on the run because uh, she failed to pay fines. Uh, associated with a host of traffic violations. Right now, um, she needs to pay a $2,300 fine. But it's not only that. She's been, she's been caught s up several times uh, uh, violating traffic rules. And uh, basically, if she needs to take care of this before uh, uh, session starts. Or at that point, she may have to start invoking her immunity so that she evades arrest. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, we, haven't heard, know, we haven't heard that before. Don't you know who I am thing again? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is there are some questions a la parallel the Duval campaign. Was she driving while her license was suspended? You know, well, you know, I don't, don't, don't ask it? me that. I mean, the no insurance, uh, is suspended license, registration, failed to appear in court. I mean, this, she's, she's apparently, reportedly, a whole host of problems. Well, here. you know, but People like their lawmakers. Look, I, I, you know, I remember when we had uh, folks elected a lawmaker who we knew the moment that he got the session ended, he was going to go to jail for his third DUI. You know, folks like their lawmakers. Now, she's sort of an untested uh, issue. Now, this immunity is interesting because it's not really immunity. It is an exemption, is a privilege from arrest or civil process while the legislature is in session. So if she can somehow make it till January 5th at noon. Just keep hiding out until January 5th. That's what you're yeah. trying to say? If Find she, a hideout if, somewhere? If she doesn't then. pay it before January 5th, and she can make it till January 5th. Then she has five months. Then, then she has basically four or five, five months, months until, yeah. until the end of the session. And then, you know, the, the, the adjourned signing die and the DPS is at the door. The, the, I think what the Democratic caucus should just do is that take out their pockets, get like $100, $200 each, 
give it to her and... <laughs> Easy for you to say, they didn't get a pay raise this last go around. No, but they still have $24,000 a year. Plus, yeah. well, plus per deal. Plus per deal. All right, we'll, uh, we'll stop it right there. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Monday on Arizona Horizon, cooling temperatures signal that valley fever season is upon us. And we'll discuss how to uh, not only properly diagnose a disease, but treatment as well. And we'll look at the National Geographic Earth Explorers Exhibition. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, meet the new dean of the Herberger Institute for the Design and Arts. Wednesday, how Arizona's international trade compares with other areas of the country. Thursday, a look at efforts to improve the state's business climate for the tech industry. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You. Have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.